So, geophysics for groundwater science and management, and picking up a bit on the theme that Pam started about scaling the impact, I'm going to be talking about how I changed the scale of my research to scale the impact. Starting a bit with geophysics for groundwater science and management, I always start with this view of our planet, our blue planet, reminds us how essential water is to everything on this planet. But only 3% of it is fresh water. And of that 3% that's fresh water, only 3% of it is surface water. So 97%, this is a schematic I use a lot. The tree is not to scale, <laughs> typically working hundreds to thousands of meters below the ground surface. Simple schematic just to define groundwater in case people aren't familiar with it. It's that water that's held in the openings in the rocks and the sediments below the ground surface. And it is 97% of the fresh water on our planet. We've always thought there was so much groundwater down there we didn't really need to worry about it. But with climate change and population growth, there is increasing concern worldwide about the long-term sustainability of our groundwater resources. And this is important not just because groundwater is a resource for humans, it supports the hydrologic cycle which supports all life on the planet. So it's critically important that we think about ways to ensure the long-term quantity and quality of our groundwater. So the question that's intrigued me for many years is, how do we get the data we need to do that? How do we actually make measurements on this system that's hidden from view down below the ground surface? Traditionally, people drill wells. And wells give you great information, but right where you drilled the well. So what's happening between the wells? What's happening below the wells? And this is where geophysics comes in. There are all these geophysical methods that we can use to remotely see below the ground surface, to obtain images of what's down there, to stitch together the well data and get a continuous image of our groundwater systems. So that's the definition or the introduction to geophysics for groundwater science and management. Now I'm going to talk about changing the scale to scale the impact. In other words, how did I go from making electromagnetic measurements in the lab to a double thumbs up when a helicopter took off to make electromagnetic measurements of the groundwater systems of the Central Valley? Well, there is a theme, and it's fun to connect the dots. What has always intrigued me and motivated much of what I've done is thinking how we can link what we measure to what is there. So that's really a recurring theme. It started off in the lab, curious as to how the presence of water in this pore space in a sandstone was impacting the dielectric permittivity that I was measuring. And the complexity was amazing. It's not just how much water is there. Is, is it coating the surface? Is it filling the pores? How did the water get in there? And then the fascinating physics you do to model that, you're applying an electric field. What are the internal electric fields in this electrically complex material? So that was fascinating, and I loved it. But I started getting curious about upping the scale of my research. And around this time, ground-penetrating radar systems were being developed that really allow you to map out the dielectric constant below the ground with these portable instruments. And this was the first 3D ground penetrating radar data set in 1990. And what you're seeing is 12 meters below the surface in Cape Cod. This is the water table, so clear evidence that water impacts the dielectric constant. And the idea that we could use geophysical instruments to recover images like this of the subsurface, I was hooked. And I kept the lab stuff going, but I was out into the field. Recurring theme, linking what you measure to what is there. A lot of people were collecting ground penetrating radar data, but we did this fabulous experiment where we collected data along a cliff face. Along came an excavator that excavated the very section we just imaged. And so then we took core samples and started trying to figure out what is it you actually capture with these geophysical data? So, 2007, it was pretty obvious in the refereed literature that geophysics was a useful way 
to study groundwater systems. And this is a slide I actually used around 2007, talking to some water agencies. And my point was we can use geophysical methods to get information about structure, lithology, properties, time-varying behavior. So why isn't everyone using geophysics? Why do people keep drilling wells? And the answer I got back, first of all, was what is geophysics? But then they didn't really believe it could work because much of what was in the referee literature was these simple case studies, studies at the Borden site, studies in gravel pits, studies that were so detached from their reality. So along with Adam Pidlasecki, who was, had been a PhD student and came back to Stanford to do this, we founded the Center for Groundwater Evaluation and Management. And we had funding, founding sponsor with Schlumberger Water Services, because they at the same time were thinking, how could we take a lot of the geophysics that we've developed for oil and gas applications and port it in to water? So they said, we're never going to do this on our own. We'll partner with you. So we started this with the whole idea of knowledge into action. And it's quite amazing. The mission, the vision, all this has not changed since 2008, so 15 years later. And this is what we said we wanted to do. The defining characteristic is the use of geophysical data as an essential part of all aspects of groundwater evaluation and management. We highlighted that we were never going to get there without partners. And that was the critical part of the GEM Center. Establishment of partnerships that allow us to demonstrate state of the science solutions from research at Stanford to their real world problems. So I kept saying, I want to work with real people in real places with real problems and take knowledge into action. Well, when we started out, we realized very early on that it wasn't just going to be taking what we did and applying it, but working with these people, we really started rethinking how we acquire and how we interpret our data. Meredith Goebel put together a time slice a couple of years ago for the GEM Center, and I'm going to be using that today. Here's where we were founded. And we started off with relatively small scale studies, kilometer in size, electrical resistivity tomography, working in a recharge pond. Here's our first field site, the Harkins Slough Recharge Pond, our first real world partner. And I have to tell you, we spent about two years trying to find someone who would partner with us. You go to water agencies, ah, too much work, too much staff time, what is geophysics, would rather drill a well. And um, it was just, we were free. And we still had a hard time finding partners. But over time, this changed. So this was one of those small scale studies where we put instruments in the pond, here is Vanessa, here's her co-advisor, Vanessa supervising Adam as he acquired seismic data in Harkins Slough. And so we did a number of these scale studies, these small scale studies. But then things started to change in 2014. And we started realizing that the problems groundwater managers were dealing with required that we started, think, required that we started to think about getting data over larger distances. And we went to the Monterey Bay area and acquired 40 kilometers of electrical resistivity data along the Monterey coast. So here's Monterey. You can see why saltwater intrusion is a problem. We've got agriculture right here, pumping groundwater. We've got the Pacific right here. And so we put electrodes along the beach and came back with a fantastic survey 40 kilometers, imaging, how far down? 200 meters below the ground surface, along the beach, showing the groundwater managers where we were in terms of saltwater, freshwater. And they were absolutely amazed. So the conversation suddenly changed from, I think I'd rather drill a well, to, you mean I just spent 300,000 drilling a well and you did this? <laughs> so they were able to see the large scale patterns, understand the large scale and look at the details of what's controlling saltwater intrusion in specific areas. 2014 changed everything in my life. Along came 
the Sustainable Groundwater Management Act. Suddenly, there was a regulatory framework in place that required agencies to understand enough about their groundwater so as to be able to sustainably manage it. There was an urgent need. High priority groundwater basins, 96% of California groundwater fell into these high priority categories that said, you need a plan in place by 2020 or 2022. And the Department of Water Resources committed to providing technical assistance. So there had been the development of a helicopter deployed system in Denmark starting around 2000. It's a fantastic way to do EM measurements. And this was a pilot study I did out in the Tulare Irrigation District. So it hadn't been flown in California for this purpose before. No one really believed it was going to work. Oh, you're going to hit the Corcoran clay. You're not going to see anything. No one believed. I said, Maxwell's equations do not die at the California border. It is going to work. And so you send a current through this transmitter loop, sets up your magnetic field, you turn it off, generates eddy currents. And the system flew off against the t across the Tulare Irrigation District. And you would hear me cheering if I had the audio on. And the data that came back was unbelievable. So this is the resistivity, looking down 400 meters below the ground surface along our flight lines in the Tulare Irrigation District. A big part of what we did here is this linking what you measure to what is there. So in fact, it was the same physics. We're making an electrical measurement. We understand the materials that are there, sand and gravel. And so we used co-located drillers logs, locations where we had a resistivity measurement from our helicopter deployed system. We knew the materials that were there. Setting up the equations, we were able to come up with a relationship to go from resistivity to sediment type. And what came back? An amazing image of the subsurface like this. So November 2016, I partnered with a groundwater manager and a professor at UC Davis. We sent a white paper to the governor's office and said, you are never going to get sustainable groundwater management unless you really improve the data you have and the way you're acquiring data. We said, you need to use airborne EM. We came up with a plan. We drew the lines on the map. We said, it's going to cost you $10 million, two years. You'll collect 20,000 line kilometers. I led a two-year pilot study saying, these are the steps you need to go through. This was launched in August 2021, $13 million for a three-year project to acquire 27,000 kilometers of airborne EM data. Getting close to the end here, 2022, last year I saw the UN has declared it the year of making the invisible visible. And I thought, amazing, they're going to be promoting geophysics all year. Well, no, they didn't. But what came out along that year was even better the best Christmas present ever, December 22nd, 25,000 kilometers of airborne EM data were released. These data are slices approximately three kilometers apart, seeing 300 meters below the ground surface in the Central Valley. So you can scroll down, we're down to 10 meters depth, 20 meters depth, 40 meters depth, 50 meters depth. The red is the coarse grain sand and gravel, the blue is the fine-grained clay. And we can see into the groundwater systems of the Central Valley. This is absolutely amazing. And what happened to the timeline this? Like with this airborne EM, the scale of our studies just increased. And California bought into this. So to finish in my one minute that I see being held up at the back, bringing us to the present, we were so thrilled to have data like this being acquired. And we realized that much of the computational workflow that we developed for working with these data should be used by others. There was too much to do, and there were like 11 of us in my research group. So we decided to start giving it away. And we did that, specifically focused on the application of finding recharge pathways. And so what we're doing is creating a web-based app where people pull in the DWR acquired data and other forms of ground-based data. And then you basically come up with a plan view that says, good place to recharge, 
bad place to recharge. And we're doing online training. So I'll just finish by making it clear that a lot of what made this happen was access to sources of funding from non-traditional sources. Schlumberger was obvious. The school, I have to tell the story about being in Pam's office and scrolling through what I was doing, and I skipped over something, and she said, what was that? I said, oh, that's measuring saltwater intrusion all along the Monterey coast. And she, I said, NSF won't fund it. The agencies want to drill wells. And she said, you have to do it. And I said, yeah. And who's got $150,000? And Pam said, I do. So that's the par of the dean <laughs> to make a big difference. At, it launched the next 15 years of my life. It launched large-scale regional geophysics in California. Gordon and Betty Moore, similar thing, meeting with the program manager. What would you do if I gave you this much money? And I said, collect data. You know, NSF, it's what's your hypothesis? All I want to do is collect data and show how amazing it is to image the subsurface. Local water agencies, Almond Board, Stanford Woods Institute, and DWR. While this happened, list of students, postdocs, research scientists, and many outside partners, all, whom, all of whom are listed on my website. So that's the story. <laughs>